Hello and welcome to the first episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your hosts. I'm John. And I'm CC. And we are here to talk to you about the truly important things in life. Politics, family, life, death, nope. Japanese fucking cartoons, baby. Well, not Japanese fucking cartoons. We're not that kind of podcast. Not yet, anyway. But yeah, <laughs> that's what we uh, plan to do. And uh, uh, let me tell you a bit about how, what the concept of the show is. So um, basically, we want to give you our impression on the anime that just wrapped up at the end of each new season. Depending on whether we both saw the show or just one of us, we will probably review either one or two series each episode. Though that may change depending on how much there is to discuss. In our first uh, episode of each new season, we will also give you a small sneak peek of the upcoming shows that uh, we think are promising and that you might want to check out, judging from their first one or two episodes. Also, starting from our next episode, uh, we will also dig into our trash stash and uh, briefly discuss the few shows we both dropped last season and why. And... If we have no material left and some time to kill until the start of the next season, we might talk about all the shows, but we will decide that on the fly. Uh, yeah, but uh, before all of that, we <laughs> want to take a few minutes and tell you a bit about, you know, how we first got into the an uh, into anime and uh, our experience with that medium. So, John, do you want to go and take the lead on that? Yeah, sure, why not? So... I remember as a young, well, not, not Babby John, John Jr., sure. <laughs> uh, back way before, this might be hard to imagine, but if you remember a time back when uh, the sci-fi channel wasn't called Siffy, they used to have a block every week called uh, Saturday Anime, and they would show different movies or whatever each week. And I remember, oh... Uh, I don't remember exactly what year it was, but I remember them showing this thing called Robot Carnival. And <laughs> it was weird. I mean, it still probably is weird. I haven't watched it since then, but it really intrigued me. And I started watching you know, other things that they showed. They showed all sorts of other movies like uh, Project Aco, which is, of course, goofy as hell. Uh, Dominion Tank Police, which is equally weird. But, you know, still still great, still very funny. Um, and then after that, I kind of fell out of watching a lot of stuff for a while because it was hard to um, really find a place that you could watch that sort of material. I mean, I guess you could say I, I watched Dragon Ball Z for a while, but for, mm. as a kid, I didn't really think, you know, oh, you know, anime, whatever, from Japan, you know. But what really got me back into it was late in high school, Cartoon Network started this block called Adult Swim. And one of the shows they put on there was a little something called Cowboy Bebop. Ah, that small show probably many people, not many people have heard of. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, maybe it was this small studio, Sunrise, don't know if you've heard of them. Mm. They, they've done other... I don't know, Gundam, I don't know if you ever heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remember sitting there with my friend Dave, and I was like, hey, let's watch the first episode of this, see if it's any good. And he, was, he watches some anime, not nearly as much as me, but he was like, grumble, grumble, okay, all right. And we watched the first episode, and we're like, holy crap, this is amazing. And we end up getting the series on DVD and just marathoning it over the course of a weekend with a few other friends. And, uh, yeah, that's what basically what really got me heavily back into anime. And now I'm so deep in the hole, I can't get back out. <laughs> Send help to John's place. Also donations. Uh, <laughs> hey, you can always use those. Send all PayPal donations, too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put that up at the end of the episode. <laughs> For now. Um yeah, man, that's totally weird. You know why? <laughs> we, um, just as a, as a quick <laughs> quick public services announcement for the viewer, we have not discussed our personal anime histories until now. I don't know why, because we've known each other for a pretty long time. But just, you know, when you talked about that, uh, there were two parallels <laughs> to my personal anime history as well, which oh. I didn't see coming at all. The first one is uh, Robot Carnival. Because the first anime I consciously recognized as such was probably that collection of shorts. 
Mm. And that was on a documentary uh, on TV here, uh, which was by uh, on a uh, it's a channel over here that uh, I don't know airs mostly artsy stuff. So it all, though it also aired Breaking Bad, which was kind of weird and cool. <laughs> anyway, yeah, they they had a um, theme night on anime and uh, a documentary and several other things uh, to watch and about Japan and everything. And yeah, uh, Robot Carnival was uh, the anime thing on there, and I I was just majorly intrigued by this. And um, I had seen anime products before, you know, probably like you have, like you said, Dragon Ball Z. Uh, I saw um, Saber Rider slash, you know, Bismarck as it's called in Japan. Um, mm, yeah. S- Sailor Moon, uh, Captain Future, Cat's Eye, Urashi Man, uh, which was known as Rock and Cop over here, and many other things. But I didn't find out that they all were, you know, produced in Japan until really getting into the uh, medium later. Back then, anime weren't classified as such on TV, TV that came later when we got Pokemon, Digimon, and, and Dragon Ball over here. So, yeah, I didn't know that they were that. At first, they were just more awesome cartoons I could watch after uh, after school. Though they always stood out to me because of their look and sometimes darker uh, or more mature plot lines. And yeah, yeah th- that's what stuck with me. And after watching that documentary and uh, finding out a classmate of mine who is also named Dave. <laughs> David, <laughs> David. See, there's the second parallel. It's super weird. <laughs> I just said flashbacks. Was is interested in, in it as well. So uh, we started checking out OVAs and Macs and also went to a con that Set Mac hosted over here. So, um, yeah, that was pretty cool. And uh, <laughs> the first anime I bought, oh boy, um, oh. was Street Fighter 2V. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> Not as, uh, as high standard as uh, Cowboy Bebop, I might say. <laughs> That's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Well, I was a big Street Fighter fan back in the day, and uh, oh yeah, and I had seen the animated movie, which was damn cool, even with the shitty German dub. Um, so uh, the TV series was kind of a no-brainer for me, and uh, boy, what a no-brainer it was! Uh, <laughs> also, not that high of a budget, uh, but anyway, I-, I enjoyed it quite a lot back in the day. Uh, it probably won't hold up if I rewatched it now, but yeah, um, still, it. Uh, it it kept me going, you know. It kept kept me interesting. I was like, hey, this is this is cool. I want to see more of that. And uh, yeah, then I watched stuff like Bubblegum Crisis and Neon Genesis Evangelion, all on VHS, which were way too expensive, by the way. Uh, I mean, <laughs> even today, it, yeah, it's still yeah. so expensive to be an anime fan. Yeah, but you anime know. enthusiast. Either way, yeah, works. But yeah, and. Uh, that kept me going. I've been following the medium ever since. Dropped in and out at certain points, but always kept an eye on it. And uh, I've been watching a decent amount of shows each season for the past, I don't know, three to four years, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how I'm going to keep up with some of the shows I'm watching because my classes are starting up again soon. Yeah. You know, that's and, and I have work. And I always, you know... Well, work y- as well. Y- you know... uh you you try to sneak in when an episode whenever you can and whenever you feel like it between all the other hobbies one has and uh, yeah uh so far it has worked out we i think we both uh don't watch and i know i can attest to that we both don't watch all the shows to which con- to their conclusion that we start with each season but a fair amount yeah I'd say. maybe half and I think I, uh, I think I might finish more than you do, to be honest. Yeah, I think so. I, I drop out on certain things uh, that you know don't hold my interest after like three episodes. I I try to give each show like at least three episodes until unless it completely turns me off from the beginning. Like it's like totally not my not my uh, subject or whatever. Totally not my interest. Uh, niche, I mean. So. We- we're not going to go into it yet, but I mean, there were some shows this season that after the, after the first episode, I was out. There was one that I was out after the second one. It was, it's a fun time to just try to try a little bit of everything. Yeah. Speaking of which, uh, let's move on into the next section of our show, and uh, that is the sneak peek.
All right, and here we are in the sneak peek where we want to discuss, or at least briefly talk about, uh, the shows that started right, well, right now, this season, that just started, which is the uh, winter season of 2016. And there are a lot of shows. Um, not all good ones, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> But we just want to take uh, our time and highlight a few shows that we think are worth mentioning and are, you know, have potential and are promising. So, uh, or, you know, promising in some way, maybe not being actually good, but fun in some way or another. Unenjoyable, goofy, doesn't, you know, have to be objectively great to the masses. No, definitely not. Just what, you know, tickles your fancy and just raise an eyebrow in a positive way. So, uh, John, why don't you start out with a show that piqued your interest? Uh, well, I started watching a couple episodes of Active Raid, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, how do I describe it? It's like future tokusatsu cops, just because the way they put on the armor, it's sort of like how the armors are worn in Gotcha Man crowds. Yeah, that's what it reminded me of. Not just because of uh, the CG and everything, just, you know, how they tra transform, maybe. Yeah, well, it's not really even a transformation. It's, you know, you go in, they put on the armor, they gear right. it up, and you right. go out and, like, hey, stop these, uh, stop that criminal scum. <laughs> um, a friend of ours uh, mentioned it being similar to an older show called Die Guard. Which, I haven't seen uh, that one. Yeah, I haven't seen either, but I did a brief reading on it. Uh, Die Guard is about, you know, the a bunch of office workers who have to fight off this alien threat but they have to deal with all sorts of stuff like uh damage claims lawsuits rivals <laughs> uh an antagonistic military stuff like that and there's elements of that in active raid where you know they have to try and minimize damage um the public doesn't have a great opinion of them uh, the other law enforcement are like, why can't you be more efficient, this, that, the other thing? And it it doesn't make it more realistic, I'd say, but it makes it a bit more interesting that, you know, oh, you can't just go around busting up everything like, you know, in every other sh show. It's they have to get the job done, but they have to get it done, you know, cleanly, get it done well, get it done, you know, more efficiently. Okay. Yeah. And acceptably in the in the public eye, so to speak. But yeah, it it makes it more I don't know f human. Yeah, yeah, relatable because you know <laughs> because it's it's kind of a standard job in that regard, and it doesn't help that I think the main character is just not giving a shit about that at all. He's like, well, I don't know, I don't, <laughs> I don't care if damage happens as long as as we stop the bad guy. Well, yeah, there. <laughs> Of the three characters they've shown getting the armor so far, one of them is like, you know, very by the numbers. Yeah. Another one of them was like, yeah, I can get this. There's no problem. Don't worry about it. And the yeah. other is she's she's the new girl. And she's like, okay, I have to get this done right. I, I don't want to mess up. And then in the second episode, she ends up tearing down a building inadvertently. Oops. Also, the that they have, a, you know, the obviously at least so far only the two male leads transform or, or let, not transform, put their their power suits on to stop crime. I don't know if if they're gonna be more, but but just like you know them having that team behind them in their mobile base that rides on on uh, on rails, like a like a more I don't know uh, tram or something like that or or a subway train. Uh, yeah, that that's also very tokusatsu esque. Mm. Remind me of some seasons of Common Rider or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not super familiar with a lot of Common Rider, but it does seem to mirror that a lot more than uh, some other similar shows have. Yeah, definitely, I can see that in there. So this uh, the uh, tokusatsu comparison is is valid. So, um, do you think the uh, show will go into anything? Um, interesting plot wise or do you think it will stay with the i don't know monster of the week uh well, you think, know we have I to think, deal with the public uh perception and everything i think a lot of shows like to start with that you know weekly bloody blue but then a lot of them try to break into a more uh, overarching plot like uh a lot of this reminds me a little bit of Psycho Pass because, you know, you have the new girl and she's learning the ropes. And, you know, mm. they start with these small cases, but then, you know, I'm sure something else will come along that'll be a much 
larger threat to like security and whatnot or mm -hmm. society rather yeah definitely i could see that happen yeah uh, i'm i'm also watching it i'm only have only seen the first episode and i i'm probably going to keep it around i'm not fond of the um you know the 3d cg uh power suits i i don't like 3d cg in anime um there's also this show right now yeah i mean i've seen worse i've seen better but i've seen worse so yeah definitely but i've just it always sticks out to me that's the problem it's it's always like this sore i don't know sore spot on on otherwise decent anime and uh, it was the same with the berserk movies and uh there's this new show uh this that starts this season that's called uh uh, Bubu Kiburanki or something like that. And, oh, yeah. And that show looks great design-wise, but it's fully 3D CG, cell shade and everything. And the character modes just look so stiff. And then there's the low frame count and everything. And everything looks choppy. It's, yeah, I, it just totally pulls me out of the show. And uh, that's a shame. Uh, so far, I haven't had that with um, uh, with F Active Raid, so I'm probably going to keep watching. Uh, looking forward to seeing more. The first show I wanted to highlight is uh, called Dimension W, I believe. I don't know if it's called Dimension Double or W. Not sure. I think it, uh, looking at the katakana in the name, it is W. All right. Because <laughs> I have seen shows that, you know, where they just pronounce W as double, so I, I wasn't sure. Well, anyway. I mean, that is a Japanese thing to use it as a placeholder for the word double, so. Y yeah. So, okay, oh, W it is. Um, so, <laughs> he, short story synopsis for that one. Uh, humanity has apparently solved the energy crisis. Isn't that nice? Uh, by, inventing, um, the de uh, by inventing devices that can harness the power of a recently discovered fifth dimension oh. called Dimension W. And the main character, Kiyoma Mabuchi, uh, hunts, down, uh, uh, hunts for fake or unlicensed coils which is the name of those devices, and runs into our other main character during one of his missions, uh, the android girl Mira Yurisaki, who was created by the inventor of the coils, who has some regrets regarding his invention. And after a rough start, uh, that android girl asks uh, Kyoma if she can help him hunt for fake coils. It's a good-looking show, just the right mix of sci-fi and, you know, urban city landscapes. You mentioned Cowboy Be Be Bebop earlier. That's what it reminded me a bit of in certain at certain times. It's adapted from the manga by Yuji uh, Iwahara and co-funded by Funimation, which, you know, probably beefed up the budget quite a lot. Oh, um, so they were actually in on the production, not just uh, getting it localized? As far as I know, yes. As huh. far as I know, they also, you know, co-produced this. It's uh, made by Studio 3 Hertz, which have only done one other show so far judging to their bio, uh, from their bio which is celestial method i have not seen that one so i can't speak of its quality or anything this so the show i think i've seen like the art for this before celestial method but i've never seen the actual show for a f second outing this this looks really good i really like the style of it and what's kind of peculiar about it is that the director can uh, kanta kame uh had so far more experience with slice of life stuff uh, like Bunny Drop and Orashura, which might explain some of the weird edits in this uh, in the first episode of Dimension W uh, that are a bit contrary to action anime conventions. He like the show cuts sometimes away at at odd moments, uh, and or puts like weird I don't know uh, character slice portraits in there that don't quite fit the scene dynamic or everything. So. Uh, I don't know if that is intentional, just the style, or if it's, I don't know, a lack of experience in that regard. However, he has also directed the Tales of Asperia movie, so I don't know. It might just be a stylistic choice. Otherwise, it's very well animated. Uh, the story has some promising beats, and I'm definitely looking forward to more. So I assume you haven't seen the first episode of that one yet. I haven't watched it, but I looked up, you know, the intro sequence just for laughs, and... Uh... <laughs> that part where uh, Kyoma is dancing in the beginning, I kind of love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I like the intro quite a lot. <laughs> so, uh, Stereo Dive Foundation, I believe I've heard them before. Oh, right, it was uh, Beyond the Boundary, or Kyokai no Kanata, I believe. Ah, all right. Yeah, that rings a bell. Here to Afternoon is the best Kyoani show. I don't care what anyone else says, but that's for another time. <laughs> So what's the other show you wanted to talk about? 
Ah, uh, what else is there to talk about? But Fantasy Star Online 2, the animation. <laughs> oh, boy. It's... Now we're getting into dubious quality. I'm just going to say it's bad. It's bad, but I can't help but love it because uh, my inner Sega fanboy needs something to latch on to because Sega won't let us play the game. Yeah, that's that's a shame, kind of. Um, so, it's uh, animated by Telecom. Same guys have been doing uh, Lupin the Third for, like, forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the quality is kind of up and down. Obviously, their main focus is Lupin the Third. <laughs> you know, even though it's... It's just technically done airing. It's already aired in Italy, but it's still running in Japan. Well, you don't know when they started producing PSO2, so maybe that, uh, I don't know, overlapped a bit. That's true. It centers around our you know, main character, Itsuki. He's going to a new school. <clears throat> it's called Sega Academy. You know, it's, it's, it's subtle. It's subtle, guys. And... Sledgehammer subtle. And, you know, he's going around doing his thing, and suddenly he's asked to join the... Uh, student council by this this girl who's perfect in every way she's got great grades she's athletic also she plays online games she's so relatable she's like hey you should play this game and write a report about it every day and, it, and i'm just sitting here like yeah oh yeah that's that's what you do with video games you write reports on what that's how sega academy rolls man when they go into the game world, one neat thing is that I believe it seems like they're using a lot of the assets from the game. So it's all like entirely accurate, all the way down to the design of the uh, main lobby uh, when the character logs in, which I know from minimal experience playing a little bit of the Japanese version of the game. I was about to say, which we probably would be able to appreciate more if we were actually able to have played that game before. <laughs> I Yeah, I played it briefly during like, one of the early betas, and I haven't mm. played it since, although I'd like to. And I mean, it's it's dumb. It is a dumb show, but they're having a little bit of fun with it because they're very subtly sprinkling in these nods to other Sega games. Well, some subtle, not others, not so much. Like, there's this big sweeping shot of the school in the first episode where, oh, those flowers are arranged in the shape of Sonic's head. Yeah, that was the one not so subtle one. It's like, okay, that's the thing. And then in the second episode, they're showing like different shots of like facilities in the school because um, Itsuki is giving the tour to this new girl, Aika. Uh, but they're showing like different shots of like, you know, the uh, study rooms, the uh, mess hall, as it were. I guess I can't really think of it. Cafeteria. That's, that's a word. That's a word I can use. Yes. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> and then they have one of like a communal bath, but there's like a statue in the middle, and it's Alex Kidd. Ah, oh, there you go. And then later on in the episode, Aika is hanging around with these three girls, and one of them calls her I I, and I'm like, wait a minute, like Monkey Ball I I? Maybe, yeah. Because <laughs> that's got to be it. It's, and I like that one in particular because there's no visual cue. It's just you know, like, oh, okay, all right. So I mean, the show is a big. If you if you uh, are a Sega fan, if you are a Sega fanboy, you're probably gonna get uh, something out of this. <laughs> I was saying to a friend of ours that I I want them to go full ham on the Sega references the way Bento did. Oh yeah, but the difference is Bento was just some random light novel adaptation. I mean, it's still great, and I thought it, I, I really enjoyed it. But this is the place for that. <laughs> Yeah, pretty. Uh, just as um, uh, Sega Girls. I don't know if you've seen that show. Oh, I have, and it was fantastic. It was fantastic. <laughs> that was like the the best Sega fan surf show I've seen so far. And uh, yeah, definitely in de like in that vein, I would like to see it completely nuts and not take itself seriously at all. I don't know if that's gonna happen because right now it feels weirdly serious at times. But maybe that's. That that will change later on. Like I, I've only seen the first episode, but <laughs> it was fun. Also the, uh, although the um, uh, the advertisement for the game in oh. the show and how it's presented is, well, <laughs> it's a it's a one big dumb infomercial. Yes, it's a definitely. Thir thirteen, twelve, thirteen, twelve. How many have however many episodes long infomercial. <laughs> It's like if you if you when you talk about eighties cartoons like how Transformers and, and, and stuff like that was like one big toy commercial. Um 
like multiply that for P for PSO2 the animation by a thousand. The Fish. anime is literally telling you if you are not playing this game, you are a piece of shit. Please play our game. Why aren't yeah. you playing our game? <laughs> you need to change your way of life. So uh <laughs> yeah, it's 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 fun. <laughs> if you, if you if you are not, you know, if you're not bothered by that, if you can, you know, take that with a smile and just nod it off and uh, yeah, yeah, the, you go, Sega, you do what you have to do to get people interested in your game. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, then, then, you know, you can probably, you can probably get some fun out of it. Uh, I, I, I hope uh, the animation gets a bit better. Again, CG backgrounds in certain uh Well, I know parts. you were... You were immediately turned off by the cast being CG, like um, the character who plays uh, one of the cast cla uh, race in the game. Cast race for people who don't know, be a PSO are the um, the androids in that series, and yeah, the uh, the android class uh, obviously are CG animated in this one as well. And to, in typical anime TV CG fashion, it's again choppy and stiff. So yeah. They're doing some weird thing with Itsuki's character in the like in the game world, where it seems like his body is CG, but his yeah, but his face, and face aren't. Yeah, right. I noticed that too. That's that's a very weird approach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be nice if they, you know, don't rely too heavily on uh, on the CG, um, because the only show that has pulled this off kind of convincingly so far, uh, I can think of, is God Eater where you know where they put up a decent mix of cg and uh, hand-drawn stuff um, yeah that's one i didn't watch either but I yeah and heard it was and good. yeah and well the story isn't but well i mean in terms of in terms of quality <laughs> yeah uh and that show you know didn't get its all its episodes finished in time to wrap up with the with the fall season or or was it summer season so um yeah i mean i commend UFO table on their work an awful lot because yeah. I think I think they're great. They do amazing work, but it sounds like they were trying too much to be too perfect with it. Mm, definitely, yeah. Couldn't probably could probably not restrain themselves at certain points where they have to be, or didn't want to use shortcuts. I don't know, or just underestimated how much work it is to make CG look that good I, I, you can see that a lot of work uh, went into that especially for certain um uh fighting uh, vignettes and uh and uh, stuff like that so um yeah uh i'm looking forward to the next few episodes on that one but also on pso2 for now <laughs> and uh, i don't know how much further i'll go with it but yeah, I, I, I want it to go full ham and just be stupid and goofy but definitely that would be the best approach I, I cannot take that show seriously, so it would be better if, if the show doesn't take itself seriously as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, the last show uh, I want to mention for the sneak peek is Boku Dakegai Naimachi, or for the people who don't want to use a ridiculously long Japanese name, uh, Erased. Oh, but half the fun of watching anime is the long, you know, names. Yes. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> you are not a real anime fan if you don't use the Japanese name. Uh, yeah, uh, that show is um, great, and I will tell you why. But first, a short story synopsis again. Our main character, uh, Satoru Fujinuma, is a manga artist who hasn't quite found his style yet and is struggling a bit with his life. This sounds all pretty, you know, mundane and unremarkable for a story setup, if not for the fact that he can turn back time. Uh, this power he calls Revival usually lets Satoru rewind time one to five minutes and helps him stop people from dying in certain cases, like accidents, uh, which we see in the first episode where he stops um, a truck driving into a little boy, I think, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, after a very important person in his life is killed, Revival sends Satoru back to his childhood, which is, you know, a bit farther than one to five minutes, <laughs> considering he's 29 years old at this point. Uh, so he can uncover the mystery around uh, a classmate of his that disappeared and died. Because apparently all of that is connected to the murder in Satoru's future life that he's trying to undo. So um, this is basically, you know, I wouldn't, it's, it's a mystery crime show with a bit of a sci-fi element to it, obviously, with the time travel and everything. A bit of, you know, butterfly effect maybe later on. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. 
um, how that pans out. It's uh, adapted from the manga by Kei Sanbei. And it's produced by A1 Pictures, which made me a bit anxious if the show would continue to look as good as it as in its first episode. Uh, because A1 Pictures sometimes drops the ball later on in the series. Um, but the second episode looks even better, in my opinion. So my worries are erased for now. I mean, A1 has done amazing work on shows like, uh, well, I know you haven't watched it, but... My personal favorite series that they've done is Working. It's very near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I know Working is, is has done good quality, and you know, Sword Sword on Online looked like great. <sighs> yeah, I, I, as much as I am loath to say there's something good about Sword Art. Oh yeah, me too. I'm, the it still looked good. <laughs> the, the animation quality in Sword Art is is pretty top notch. Yeah, but you know, there are shows like. Um, I don't know that they're mostly their B team worked team worked on uh, like um, Maji for example, which is a great show. I like that quite a lot. Uh, but you know the first episode looks great and then it tumbles down a bit and then for some showcase episodes or some tempo episodes, they just pull out the A team again and then it looks good again. But there are some really bad look episodes in that show and I I hope that doesn't happen for uh, for this one. But it only has twelve episodes and they're short season shows tend to look uh, a bit better in general so i mean the second episode seemed like it was still fine in terms of quality yeah yeah, so. yeah, yeah that's what i noticed so i said it, it prop it even looked better in some parts in the first episode so uh yeah definitely uh and the show is oozing atmosphere like in every frame it, with its setting plot device and central mystery it's it's enthralling and it kept me at the edge of my seat the entire uh, time for both episodes i'm really interested to see uh like how the mystery develops and uh, what the characters are going to do and everything. Everyone is very sympathetic and, well, not everyone, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, relatable. And, and uh, you know, I'm interested to see where they're going. Yeah, I. Uh, it's probably the one show I look forward to most each week. Mm -hmm. Me too. And, I mean, what really hooked me in was the initial promo video where they're talking about... Um, it's one line that they kind of keep reusing in the show, and I think they're going to try and make like a theme out of it. You know, when you speak and the words leave your mouth, you know, it almost feels like they become real. And that's something that they've said a few times now. Yeah. And the other big thing that grabbed me in that trailer is uh, when I learned that the music is done by Yuki Kajiura. Oh, it is. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. And her work is incredible. Yeah, definitely. But also, it's very recognizable usually, and, and I didn't recognize her being on this at all when I listened to the soundtrack of the of the show for the first two episodes. That's weird to me because I I associate you know Kajiro with a very distinctive sound, you know, from uh, Hex Sign and shitty shows like Noir <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, uh, what other stuff and maybe the soundtrack to to uh, the last two Xenosaga games and stuff mm. like that. It's got this very very recognizable kind of string melodies to it. Uh, her yeah. her songs really have and I didn't either. I just completely blanked that out because I was focused on other stuff in this episode uh, in those episodes. But I I did not recognize her. So that's that's interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna pay a bit more attention to that in the future to uh, see if we can like oh yeah that definitely sounds like Yuki Kajira. Uh speaking of music this season I forgot to mention our active rate that another connection to Code Geass is it has the same uh, composer Kotaro Nakagawa and he's awesome. Yeah. I like the soundtrack of Code Geass so and cuz another show that he's been doing uh that's been running for a little over a year now or close to a year and a half is Yu-Gi-Oh Arc 5 and it probably has the best soundtrack since 5D's. How's that show panning out in general, by the way? I know ah. Zeal was a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Zeal or Zexel or however you want to call it was... It got dumb, and I just kind of got out of it really quickly, and I lost interest. But Arc 5 has been... It's hard to call any Yu-Gi-Oh! series uh, anything other than an advertisement for the game, but it, it's fun for what it is, and the characters are at least pretty good. All right. Good to hear. Oh, yeah. Uh, so another quick thing I wanted to mention about Erased is the voice actor of the uh, adult version of the main character. Um, uh, wait, his name is Shinosuke Mitsushima. Uh, has not done anything in anime before, apparently. And his subdued performance is very unique. Yeah, I 
took a quick look at it a few moments ago. Apparently, he's done like some drama stuff, but this is yeah. like his, his first big voice acting gig. Yeah, and you definitely feel it. I, I don't know if they actually, you know, did that on purpose, like went for him for that. Um, it, it feels like they did. I get so that they were trying to accentuate him uh, as being just a normal, unremarkable guy. Yeah. Uh, as he is in the series, the only problem so, uh, problem so far I have with this is uh, his sober performance is always on the verge of sounding bored in a lot of scenes, and uh, I I don't know if that can back will backfire in the future. So far it hasn't, but he always I don't know he he sounds a bit dry at points where it isn't really necessary or where he shouldn't in my opinion. But you know I'm I'm not an expert, so uh, I mean I kind of feel like at parts it works because you know. He's 29, things haven't really exactly gone his way. So it's hard to be, you know, just, hey, you know, her, 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 all the time. Yeah. So, you know, the way he's kind of like, you know, this is my job, this is what I do. Sometimes there's this thing called revival. But when it happens, he's like, wait, I have to make, I have to watch out. What, what's happened? What's wrong? What can I yeah. fix? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's interesting and, uh, I'm just not used to it. You are used to, uh, with your uh, anime uh, voice actors, you're used to them performing, mostly overperforming certain yeah. scenes, like putting a lot of emotions into it. And I like that. I, I, that's, that's one of the reasons I, I, uh, I like watching anime in its original language. They, they put a lot of emotions into it, but not to the bring, at least in my opinion of it getting annoying. And, uh. I don't know, I just, I, I don't get that from this performance, but it doesn't mean that it's bad or that I won't like it or cherish it overall. It's just, it's, I just want to say it's really different and I'm not sure I'm, I'm really liking it yet. <laughs> so we'll see where, where this goes. Um, yeah, but the show, uh, th this is, like you already said, this is the show, the season that uh, has its hooks firmly placed in my skin or under my skin and uh, that I will keep on watching definitely mm. all right so john um, yeah. what would you do if you could kill any opponent with just throwing a single punch. Oh man, I, I think I'd become a prize fighter. And then I'd have to spend the money on my bail to get out of jail, oops. <laughs> well, shit happens. I mean, things are not going as bad for the main hero of the show we are gonna discuss today, because he has that ability. Uh, but he's also not happy with it. In fact, he is bored to death and uh, feels kind of depressed. Um, every day feels the same. A villain shows up, introduces himself with death, destruction, and a menacing speech, elaborating on his origins. And then uh, our hero Saitama just punches his brains out. That's his way of life, and it's not too interesting. It's become stale, and things only start to getting a bit more interesting and lively uh, when uh, Saitama runs into a young cyborg called Genos, who starts idealizing Saitama and uh, calls him Sensei, and uh, because, you know, Saitama is so fucking strong, and makes Saitama kind of unwillingly accept him as a pupil. And yeah, that's where pretty much the story begins, and those two uh, experience a lot of adventures together, and cause a lot of turmoil and also fun for the viewer. Uh, of course, the show we're talking about is um, the big, big show of fall season 2015, and that is One Punch Man, It's which is, I don't know, is it a phenomenon right now? Is it as big as Attack on Titan? I'm not sure. Uh... I don't know if it's as big as Attack on Titan. I mean, I could be wrong. I don't know about, you know, stuff trending in Japan, but I know, you know, it made its name for itself. Definitely. Starting yes. off as a very, very simplistic uh, webcomic. We, we don't have pictures for you, but you must imagine uh, that looking like, I don't know, a, a short newspaper sketch or something. Like, really, really simple designs, uh, not intricate anime or manga designs. And uh, they put those in the anime sometimes as well, just, you know, as characters just of the of the main characters and, and for, you know, comedic purpose and everything. So that, that's neat. So if you want to know how the show, how the origins of the show look, they are still in there. They, uh, the show has not forgotten them. And that is cool. It's, it's produced by uh, Studio Madhouse. Uh, it's based on the manga by author under the pseudonym One, 
who created the original webcomic, and the artist Yusuke Murata, who, by the way, for the few Mega Man fans out there, which John and I are, uh, sketched out the uh, rough designs for Dust Man from Mega Man 4 and Crystal Man from Mega Man 5. How about that? Yeah, I believe he was... Like, I know a lot of in the Mega Man games, original ones in Japan, they would hold contests to pull together he uh, designs, and I guess they pulled in his designs for two different games. So, Yeah, it was pretty cool. Obviously, he, he has advanced a bit since then. <laughs> yeah. If you look at the manga, his drawings are really great. There are some really showstopper scenes in there. And they translated those uh, really well to the, uh, to the anime. If you, there are enough uh, picture comparisons be between uh, manga and anime frames uh, out there on the web. If you want to search for that, you definitely can. And you will see that they did really good work in capturing the immense scale and, I don't know, fierceness of some of the scenes in the manga for the anime. Like a giant spaceship, for example, that just hovers over the city, looks just as impressive, and uh, they did really, uh, a really good job with that. Um, yeah, uh, the basic genre for the show, I would say, is um, it's, it's a parody, it's a comedy. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely an action show. Uh, like, there's a lot of fighting in that show, and it's really well choreographed looks fantastic madhouse of course has a lot of experience with action shows one of their most recent ones i really liked was the um remake of hunter hunter uh which had a lot of great battle scenes in it and i'm actually right now i can't i don't know if any people who worked on that show also worked on that show but i know people who for example, worked on Full Metal Alchemist and Space Dandy for Bones. Worked also on this show. Actually, the director of Space Dandy is the director for One Punch Man as well. Yeah, and I know they called in a lot of help, I believe, from Gainax as well. You can definitely see the you know, styles of, of different people who worked in, on several well-known projects like Ooze out of this show and, and Between the Lines. I mentioned the director before, Shingo Natsume. He has worked on stuff like Gurren Lagann and Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, besides directing Space Dandy. And so he was a great choice for the show. And uh, oh, yeah. you can see a lot of his past experience just in terms of setting the pacing and everything. It works really well. And if, if you want to know more about uh, just the background of the show and the people who worked on it, just, produ just in terms of production, I recommend the uh, Enemy News Network article, The Secret of One Punch Man's Success. It's, it's an interesting read and there's some interesting background information in there just in terms of production and everything and why that show looks so good because even though it has, especially in the first and last episode and in between, all, all the way through, uh, has some real impressive scenes just in terms of animation camera panning character design pretty much everything the budget for that show is not that much higher than for other action shows at least that's what the, what the crew is saying it sounds like they're really? working with normal numbers yes actually and it's just that a lot of passionate people who love this kind of show work on this project and just basically poured their blood and sweat into this and you can see that you can see that in every frame of this show it just looks so great um yeah, it came through in the beginning all the way to the end yeah there are very few scenes in that show where i would say eh they they really like rested rested their arms on this one <laughs> 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 I, I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know how they pulled this off. Going on this level for 12 episodes straight, it's, it's crazy. Spoilers ahead. We can give you an outline, basic outline of the story. After Saitama meets up with Genos, because Saitama gets mistaken for a villain... And yeah. he's, he's pretty much not well known as a hero. He always defeats like the biggest bad guys, but since nobody is around seeing him do that because the a-list heroes don't give a fuck and the other heroes are already beaten and well the citizens are dead uh, nobody sees him like beat up the the biggest bad guys and that's why you know he's he's not a well-known hero and in one of the episodes he gets confused with uh, uh with one of uh, uh the villains of the week just because he's bald <laughs> And that's when he decides, or uh, just from after a recommendation from Genos, uh, to sign up the with the Hero Association, who manages all of the heroes in in that show, basically, who may, from from the different cities and like tells them where to go and where uh, emergencies are and everything. Just assigns them their uh, their missions, yeah. uh, pay, pays them, does a promotion for them, and everything, basically. They also 
break down the heroes by class and they give them missions yeah. according to that. That's also an interesting part of the show. It's not just it's it's mostly a, a big dumb action comedy, but there's also some nice social commentary sprinkled in between, you know, on prejudices, need culture, class society, stuff like that. Uh, the way the hero association and some of its members operate, how the actual high-ranked heroes act versus the lower-ranked, and how the attitude of the citizens that populate the cities uh, in this show is characterized. It paints some very clear parallels to our society, even though, you know, we don't have superheroes. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but yeah, it, it definitely has a bit of subtext and sub substance to it, even though it's mostly an action comedy. So uh, if you want some uh, some meat with your bones, there's definitely that. Um, yeah, because they also say, you know, Saitama starts off as rank C, and in order to keep his rank, he has to... Was it he has to resolve like some level of uh, trouble, whether it be you know a purse snatcher or this that the other thing, at least once a week. Otherwise, he'll rank down, or was yeah. it rank down, or be like kicked out of the hero association entirely? If if you are rank C, you get kicked out. If you mm. are uh, above rank C, I don't think you have to do like weekly missions. That's why he move, uh, decides to move up because he doesn't want to deal with that. <laughs> yeah, that kind of. I don't want to get up on a soapbox or nothing, but doesn't that kind of speak to uh, how we are as a society? The people on the bottom have to work harder to get to where they want to be, but the people on the top can just, you know, be like, hey, you know, sup, I'm rank S. Yeah, I, I don't have to give a shit. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely some, the show is saying something about that. That's that's totally obvious. Like, it's, I, it's, it's, it's not subtle about uh, uh, this in some regard, if you want to look at it. But if you want to ignore it, you can do that too, so. Maybe it's not the level of social commentary, you know, that Hideo Kojima put into Metal Gear Solid 2, for example. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's there. also it's it's also not quite at, as out there. Yeah, <laughs> but it's 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 definitely entertaining. It's not uh, I don't know overbearing or anything like you know weighing down the story or the entertainment. But it's it's in there and it's cool that it's in there and it's like makes you say, think about things sometimes and that's that, that's good. Yeah. Uh, I I appreciate that. Um. So yeah, and then they sign up with the Hero Association, and yeah, basically. F fight a few more villains and uh yeah at the end of the show there's this giant threat that they have to overcome not much is happening for now though they are building you know a lot of setups for you know future developments basically the the, the first season of the show is like getting to know all of the different characters all the heroes how the there's world building uh a lot of it like how the whole world how hero association works and and it's mostly about Sai Saitama, you know, coming across a new opponent and, you know, hoping that this is the one who can give him a challenge. That's pretty much it for now. I mean, I think, was it Murata was saying, you know, he, he was pushing for a second series? Someone w on the team was. I'm pretty sure. The manga is, I think, very, uh, very successful and the anime was even more so. It would be sad and not really understandable if they didn't produce a second season. It's going to be a while, I think. Well, yeah. Because, you know, they have caught up to a lot of the manga stuff. They have to give the artists, <laughs> artists and, and the uh, story uh, creator a bit more time to write new things up. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure once they get ahead enough, we're going to see a new season. And a would little be bit of a... Not a and a little bit of a break from, you know, the insane work they did on the show to begin with. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm, I'm, you can see that they enjoyed it, too. So oh, yeah. I, I, I don't feel we, like we have to be sorry for them. I don't think... I, I hope the working conditions at Madhouse are not that bad. Quick question here. Uh, what were your favorite episodes? Well, I mean, I think... <laughs> I think one of my favorite episodes, or one of my favorite scenes was when Saitama meets Genos in the street <laughs> with the mosquito girl. And he just punches her out, and Genos is just like, what just happened? What just happened? I was going <laughs> to blow myself up, but what just happened? Yeah, a lot of people don't know how to react when they see Saitama, like, punch out a... Uh... A guy like with just yeah with one punch with one attack. I in terms of reaction, I think Saitama is just my favorite when it comes to 
just a new villain appearing and rattling off his fucking, you know, threatening monologue about where he came from and what he's going to do to the world. And Saitama just has this the look on his face that is saying, I've heard this a million times before and I know how this is going to end. You are wasting my time and I don't give a shit. He's just like, I'm, I'm just a hero for fun. Yeah, man, and, and <laughs> you're not giving me any fun. So whatever, just do what you have to do. Your history in a few minutes, and it's it's great. <laughs> it and, doesn't take uh, itself seriously at the beginning, and I mean, it kind of does toward the end with you know how crazy the last battle is, but arguably it oh. doesn't take itself seriously at the end either. Boy, talk about the last episode, man! That's one of my highlights. Mm. I just in terms of visual prowess, you, I I couldn't help but just be floored. And my 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 jaw was was uh, in my lap, and <laughs> pretty much the entire time during that battle, just what they what they pulled off. At times you don't know what's happening because <laughs> because the action is so crazy on screen, but it's just it's a blast to watch if you like action. That is, and if you like animation, definitely just wow. I think anyone can appreciate the amount of effort put into this show. Really, oh, def. I hope so. Saitama's character is not too complex, but I like that they uh, give him uh, s some some interesting beats here and there. Where, um, for example, this this one asshole after he beats the Sea King is like, "Well, all the low rank heroes got beaten, so the heroes are so weak, and he's just a bit stronger." It's just like, "Oh, we came here just to finish the job." Yeah. And and Saitama just picks up on that so the uh, and says, yeah, that's what I did. And be sure to tell everyone. And he does that to make the other heroes look better. Uh, so that the, the, the citizens appreciate the lower rank heroes as well as, you know, the A ranks heroes and S rank heroes who turn out to be mostly douchebags. <laughs> actually, well, not all of them. Not all of them, but a lot, like half of them maybe. Yeah. Are very, they're very self-centered and a lot, a lot of them... Don't give a shit what uh, about about even the lower missions. Even if it's about helping people, they don't care because I don't know. They're not the missions are not high profile enough, or it's too dangerous to to waste your life in in quotes on these kind of missions. I remember the it's, big name one in particular was it a uh, a my mask. He was just like you know I can't be bothered to deal with this, and it's like yeah, some hero you are. Yeah, exactly. He's he's gonna. I feel like he's gonna be a big um a. Big factor in the next season. Like, he has villain potential, like, interesting villain potential in terms know. of... He's a, he's a hero, but he's he's an asshole hero. <laughs> yeah. So he's an antagonist, let's put it like that. Anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to the, uh, to them developing that and where that goes. And also, the, the, the first episode, I liked how they set, set Saitama's character up as, like, having this, this deep-seating hope of finally having someone challenging his potential and where there is like this immense battle and at the end it turns out to be you know just a dream sequence and you feel so sad for him because he's so happy at the end of that fight because <laughs> he really has to go all out and like pull out all the stops and uh, go full force on his opponent and then yeah well it's not true <laughs> and then the guy some version of the guy he dreamed of turned uh, turns up to challenge him and again he kills him with one punch and uh, is flabbergasted and angry and then the uh, rest of them just are like oh whoa see ya it was funny but i also felt very sad for satima also that's that's a point where um for me like some people said uh this show likes a proper amount of tension you know that Saitama can finish off every opponent with one attack. There's no threat for him. And there's no really a point of drama in the show where he's in danger to die or anything or to lose a battle. And I can see people having a problem with that approach. Mm. But in my opinion, the tension is built through, first of all, getting the side characters into danger. You know? Yeah. Because make the side characters, or at least some of them, relatable, like Genos or um, Moomin Rider, who's a big, I don't know, fan favorite, but I like him a lot because he's like, he's this upstanding kind of low ranked hero like who he, just. He tries his best, but you know. And he, yeah, and he's like the op exact opposite of some of the douchebag S ranked uh, heroes. He's like, he's in it to help people. Yeah. And even if he is no match whatsoever for the villain, he's tr he's giving his damnness to fight him. He's uh, also bothering with the with the very low, uh, you know, um, 
with the very small scale missions like i don't know getting a cat from from a tree for a girl he's doing everything he's doing everything to help people and that's why he's he's a people's champion um, yeah he's you know he's a good guy he he's, he cares he's, he's a good guy also an amazing parody on uh, Kamen Rider. oh yeah uh, <laughs> yeah he's a good guy and uh He's one of the first to recognize after Genos what kind of guy Saitama is and befriends him. And he's very vulnerable. He can be killed with, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. By most of the bad guys in that show. And putting guys like him in danger, that's one of the things how they build up tension. They put the uh, other characters who are relatable and, and fun and sympathetic into danger. And, you know, Saitama is not always available in the beginning has to get there and you're wondering well will he get there in time for people for the other heroes not to die <laughs> i mean genos is dismantled and on the brink of death several times during that show he's really heavily damaged <laughs> and could <laughs> also die at any minute even though he's fucking strong and also an s-ranked hero uh, after a while so uh yeah that happens and also I think wishing for Saitama to finally find an opponent that gives him a challenge is also a kind of tension that builds up in the show. Because with each new villain that comes up that is like super strong, you really wish for you know that to be the one who gives Saitama at least a bit of a challenge. Mm, definitely. When it turns out that doesn't happen. Of course, you're cheering for Saitama when he like punches out a major asshole with one punch. It's always a great moment. Just... <laughs> The scening and everything. But you're also, in the back of your head, you're kind of sad. It's like, ah, well, gotta wait for the next one. It's, <laughs> it wasn't it that, it wasn't this one, big guy. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, it's all at once disappointing for him, but at the same time, it's very uh, visceral and satisfying to see, you know, boom, hey, I won. Yeah, it's great. If you can look at it that way and see uh, the tension building up over that and, and having your drama, you know, build up that way. I think I think there's enough of that in there. But like I said, I can also see why people find the formula of him like winning every fight without any effort pretty much a bit tiring. But that's also that's what bothers the main character as well because that is his problem because that's how his life is. It's the same thing every time and he doesn't get the the thrills and and the excitement and the near death experience that the other heroes get, so he just wants the, uh, the rush of battle. Yeah, just as Saitama, we have to experience our rush uh, through some of the other heroes as well, at least when it comes to uh, the threat of imminent death. <laughs> so who were your favorite characters? Well, I mean, there's Saitama. Obviously. <laughs> I mean, the best thing about him was just some of his reactions. That show has spawned a lot of uh, reaction gifs. Oh, yeah. Uh, who else is great? I think uh, Tatsumaki or Tornado, whatever you want to call her was great too just because she was so prone to being very hot and cold toward everyone mm, yeah see, see she is such a brat <laughs> uh, she that's why she ends up as the butt of uh, of the joke from Saitama speaking of butt of the joke there's Sonic as well oh yeah god damn it <laughs> he always not... gets the short end of the stick I, I love that. I did not see that coming when they introduced his, his character. He's so hilarious in his douchiness and also he's <laughs> how like, he's beaten on several occasions. He's just like, oh, I'm the greatest. Wait, crap. All of his encounters with Saitama were just class A comedy material. I loved it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I also like Genos just because of his uh, design. His character is a bit bland, although he definitely has his moments in terms of you know comedy and everything. He just wants uh, to live up to his sensei. I don't know if you're bad for liking him because he's such a cliche at this point, but Puri Puri Prisoner as the <laughs> fucking the, the muscly, bulky gay dude, ov overly prissy gay dude is... is uh, he's so wonderfully if... fabulous, though. Yeah, he's a, good, he's a sympathetic guy. I mean, he's just <laughs> over the top, but... Uh, I like him quite a lot. He's fun. Yeah. And uh, there is ah, there are so many colorful characters in the show. Uh, and I'm looking forward to spending more time with them. This was definitely for me the must-see show of uh, the fall season last year. And uh, it's a definite gateway drug for people who like superhero stuff in general. I had a friend who is not into anime at all sit in uh, while I was watching an episode. Or he came in while I was watching an episode with another friend of mine. And the the non weeaboo 
<laughs> asked me if we could watch the rest of the episode the next time he would be around because he was really, really intrigued by the stuff that was going on on the screen. And he's not into the, the uh, art aesthetic of anime and usually, and from my own experience, it has broader appeal. Like, it definitely can even... If, if you want to find... Want to recommend an anime to people who are really... Who generally are not into that, One Punch Man is one of those shows like Cowboy Bebop and... Uh, what else is there? Black Lagoon. I feel like Attack on Titan. Attack on has Titan has that potential as well. Had, definitely, like it's one of those shows that that reach outside of their medium and can you know might be interesting to other people as well. So definitely put that on on uh, One Punch Man on that list. Yeah, you know, the the animation, the and and the cast that they had, like it, they had an amazing cast. Just to name a few: Kaito Ishikawa, Aoi Yuki. Uh, Makoto Furukawa, Rikia Koyama as the Sea King. Like one of my friends was like, I don't know how I feel about him. I was like, dude, he's great. He 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 can go from being super serious, like in Fate Zero, you know, mm-hmm. a very straight laced kind of guy, to being just this goofy big bad that he was in One Punch Man. Yeah, it was great, and he went all out on that. I uh, the Sea King episode is one of my highlights as well, just because of the villain. His build up is great. Uh, obviously, hey, <laughs> the way he skilled off is uh, the same as the other guys. But the, like I said, the build up to that is is like ninety percent of the fun, and that was great because he like put so many uh, other heroes in trouble, and uh, yeah, and uh, mocks them in a, in a in a great way. And he looks cool, like like in a very weird way with a stupid little crown on his head and <laughs> his his weird facial. Uh, disfiguration and transformation and s- at certain points so uh he was great i, I like i don't know who saitama's uh, vo- uh, voice actor was but uh his his non plus i don't know commentary on cer- th- certain things was just a blast i mean furukawa uh saitama's voice actor he hasn't been in a lot that i've watched like the one show that i mean he, he was in Aldo Noah zero i guess yeah yeah, that's again a discussion for another day. But mm-hmm. the one big role that I remember him in was uh, Bonri in Golden Time, and I I loved that show. So great! I hope we will see more of him uh, and uh, more One Punch Man. Okay, that is a wrap on the first episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the amazing Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the great Jay Kaufman. Please go to virt.bandcamp.com and check out his music. It's fantastic. You can find us on YouTube, iTunes, Twitter, and soon on animebrainfreeze.com. Leave us a comment anywhere you like. Thanks for tuning in, and please join us again next time. Adios! See ya!